Hello and welcome back to another video on WD18, the Watford fan channel. And welcome to another really special video we've got today on the channel. Tomorrow, at the time of recording, this will be 10 years since Troy Deeney scored that iconic goal against Leicester. And today we're joined by none other than Jonathan Bond, who was in the squad that day, watching from the side. Jonathan, how are you, mate? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Very good. And if you haven't been following Jonathan's career, he's currently at LA Galaxy, uh, living the life out there, it seems. How's that been for you at the moment? Yeah, it's been amazing. I'm into my third season here now. Um, loving every minute of it. The first two seasons went went really well for me personally. So, yeah, it's been good to to get a lot of lot of games, a lot of game time. And, um, and yeah, I, I think I've just come off the back of a two-month injury, which has been my first real setback since being here. So... Um, my first game back was last night and hopefully now I can um, put another run of games together. Can you name drop any A-listers that you're, you're hanging out with out there? Um, you really want me to name drop, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, within our, team, it's, within our team itself, we've got Chicharito, obviously, who's at United, Douglas Costa, who's at Bayern and Juve, Ricky Puj, who's, came, who's come from Barcelona, Martin Caceres, who's at Juventus. I mean, from the football side of things, yeah, Jonathan De Santos, Gio De Santos. There's, there's loads of big names that are associated with with the club, and then just in general, you kind of you go through life and you meet many, many people. Not necessarily that you become friends or whatever, but you say hello and this, that, and the other. But yeah, it's, everyone seems to be here at some point. Love that. It's good to hear you're back from injury as well, and a great win last night. But going back all the way back from today, back to 2012. Obviously, the Pozos had just taken over Watford. Um, it was a summer of huge change um, at Vicarage Road. What was it like to be in and around that? Did they communicate with you that it was going to be a big summer of change at the time? No. Um, I remember just reading a lot of stuff that seemed to be going on and then it all kind of happened quite quickly. Um, I went from a club financially really struggling to suddenly bring in players from all over Europe um, namely really Italy so then I had um, one of my idols Gianfranco Zola was suddenly the manager and it all just happened so quickly and suddenly it was a really exciting place to be and we all felt quite lucky to be there um, uh, so yeah I mean it was uh, a, whirl a bit of a whirlwind and I remember the squad being huge like in pre-season there were just so many people with plenty of loans and and permanent transfers and we still had the remaining squad from the season before so it was an interesting mix but it actually worked quite well and it turned out to be quite a memorable season I think. You mentioned Zola was your idol when he came in what was he like as a manager compared to different managers you've had during your career and how good was he in training them did he score any against you? He did he was very very sharp in training honestly um he was so fit as well. He was really in physical great condition. Um, yeah, you could just see immediately just the way he moved his body was was really sharp, even at, at the age he was at the time. And how he was as a manager was definitely how you see him as a person. It was no different. Everyone just had complete respect for him. No one would disrespect him. No one would overstep the mark. Everyone would kind of... Um, yeah, he would he would rule by respect, not through fear. Um, everyone wanted to do really well for him every time they played. So um, his career, obviously, before becoming a manager, definitely helped with, with that being the case. Oh, that's good to hear. And Charlie, a question for you here. As a Watford fan at the time, obviously, you're a bit older than me as well, so you probably remember it a bit clearer. Um, what, was it, <laughs> what was it like for you as well? Just, I mean, as, as Jonathan said, going from a club who was... Our financial future was in a bit of jeopardy going to the security with a whole new load of players. What was that like for you as a fan? Just pure excitement. That's all I remember. Like Jonathan said about we were that club that were kind of teetering in the mid-range of the championship. I think we were overachieving by finishing mid-table. A lot of the Academy of graduates were given opportunities simply because they had to. Um, there was talk of kind of threats of administration and then this summer, when the Pozzos came in, I remember there was pictures of like seven signings at one time on one day. Um, and like I said, it's just really exciting. And then that, I can remember so well that first day of the season against Crystal Palace. 
it was a thriller. I think we won 3-2 in the end and Vidra scored a worldie. And I just thought, this is amazing. And it just went on to be probably one of the my favourite seasons of all time, just because it was so new, so fresh, so many new quality players coming in and um, didn't have the, the ending we wanted, but it was an amazing time. Yeah, I think I remember reading as well, Jonathan, that um, there were so many players at that point that the club had to separate into two separate dressing rooms. Is that true? And how, how was it separated if it is? That was true. However, I think the way that the changing rooms were at the time, I think that was always the case anyway. I think it was basically like one long hallway and then at the end of the hallway split off into two different dressing rooms, which literally like doorways were facing each other. And they were, neither of them were that big. Um, so really, maybe beforehand it was first team and then sort of first team, not not quite starters, maybe kind of more squad on the other side. But definitely th- this season we're talking about, it was split right down the middle. It was just like we definitely needed the, the full two changing rooms. Yeah, it was a big squad. What, what was that first? What was that season like for you personally, especially the first half? Um, I'm pretty sure you were number two at that point, but the team were doing really well the first half of the season. Were you? Was it good to be with Almunia? Are you pushing him, or, or a bit frustrated to be on the bench? No, I think I was so young at the time. I was 19 during this season, so um, I'd kind of just broken through, made my debut under Daishi the the year before. And um, I was kind of happy to be a part of now what was seems to be a really exciting sort of new dawn. <clears throat> and then suddenly we had Manuel Munio, who's you know played so many games in the Premier League for Arsenal and West Ham. And I was just going along with it. Honestly, I was just sort of like, wow, this is amazing! I wanted us to win every game. Um, I think everything had happened so quickly that I hadn't had time to sort of be like. I want to be number one, I want to push Almunio and I want to be playing, blah, blah, blah. I was just sort of happy to be involved. Um, and then as the season progressed, I actually did get quite a bit of game time because Manu being at the age of 36, 37, didn't stay fit um, all the time. I think there were a lot of times where I thought I was going to play even more games than I did. Um, but yeah, it was um, it was a season where I was happy enough being in the squad and getting some games and being involved that was kind of where I was at at 19. Yeah, you mentioned there as well about um, Almunia's fitness uh, problems, particularly towards the end of the season. And obviously he had a brilliant season for us that year. Um, but a game that he did get injured in in the warm-up was that Leeds game on mm-hmm. the final day of the season. You ended up starting, getting injured. Do you want to talk us through that whole day in terms of when you found out you were starting to what eventually happened? Yeah, honestly, mental day. Like, I remember the bus coming in, the atmosphere was incredible. Um, the fans were just so up for it. I just think everything that had gone that season, we all felt like it was something was going to happen that day. Um, and yeah, it was, it's just in the air, you know, when it's hot and it's sunny, there's just something different about the end of season sort of those games. And I remember going through the warm up and right at the end, Manu's, I think he took a cross and he's just muttering to himself and like he just looks fuming kind of thing and I was, my stomach was starting to go because I was like, to be honest, (laughs) I'm not sure I want to play that much today, like (laughs) just maybe hopefully Manu can stay fit today and just play this game because this was, this was a huge game Um, and I was thinking, oh shit, basically, like I haven't really done my proper warm up, I've not come in Obviously, you come in always with the knowledge, especially with Manu, that you could be playing. But to kind of do just serving Manu, doing a few bits like in between and you're doing the shooting session, so suddenly you're playing in the biggest game of the season. It was like, for a 19-year-old, it was a lot. So, what was Jack Bond thinking at that time? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't, I think he still thought he was all right at the time. Do you know what I mean? Like, he still had me to go and play. Um but anyway, then we've gone in and Manu was still being tested. So I was in my kit and I remember going into the physio room and they were, they were really like, it was to the point where the team were leaving to go in the tunnel and I was in the physio room with Manu and the physio and we were like testing his hamstring. Like, does that hurt? How, how does that feel? Like, is this... And I, I'm, I'm sort of hovering over because I'm waiting. Am I going into the tunnel or am I 
um, getting ready to go on the bench. Like, what am I doing? And anyway, Chambo, the goalkeeping coach, obviously Alec Chamberlain, um, just came out into the change room and was like, you're in. Like, all the best. Go and fucking just do it. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, like, all right, yeah, come straight <laughs> out. <laughs> and then obviously after five, ten minutes, you've just settled in anyway. It's like any other game. Um, but it, it was fine. But then, yeah, what happened after that? sort of out of my control really it's definitely good didn't see that one coming what actually physically happened obviously someone I can't remember was it Anya running back and um, yeah his name Don Polio and he did push him yeah was it just kind of that momentum and his arm clocked you and kind of did you get knocked spark out from that yeah literally there was a ball over the top I've come out to collect it by the corner of the box Akechi sort of beating their player to to the ball but he's in a they're both in a full sprint and it's a little bit you know it's a little bit my fault as well because when when you're a little bit nervous and it's a big game you're not thinking about protecting yourself all you're thinking about is getting the ball and like once I got the ball really if I was relaxed and I played you know hundreds of games whatever you kind of grab the ball and you just turn and protect yourself but I was just so focused on getting the ball that I've just gone ball and I've just sort of put my head like it's there to be hit really and Ketchy's just caught me with an elbow I think like straight across and I only can tell you this because I've seen it back so many times but I was yeah I was just gone out cold face planted into the floor and I woke up maybe a few minutes later um, and everyone was really worried and I didn't know what had happened and I went into the, the ambulance with my dad and my, da- my dad came down from the stand was in the ambulance and everyone's looking at me like so down kind of thing. And I just immediately assumed that I'd made a big mistake. Do you know what I mean? In the game, I was like, oh no, what did I do? And they, no one would say anything. And I was like, just tell me, I just need to know. I need to know what happened. Like, how did the goal go in? They're like, no, mate, honestly, you, you didn't. It was absolutely fine. And I realized, okay, it's fine. I was just so worried about making a mistake in the game that um, I wasn't actually realizing it was because I'd been knocked out. I was a bit all over the place, to be honest. He, he, he went on to score and he uh, he gave a bit to our, our fans. Do you have any kind of resentment towards him for that action or do you just think it's just a game? Stuff like that happens. Yeah, not yeah, not really. I, I didn't I actually didn't know he scored in the game and I didn't know he gave um gave it to our fans, to be fair. Um that is a bit annoying. But he um He's just not someone I think about ever, really. He's just so... I, I don't really give much thought to... I well, like it, yeah. Yeah, well, he's he's playing for Ebsley and you're in LA at the moment, so we, we know who you're <laughs> Yeah, who's winning there. Obviously, the person who came on uh, was Jack Bonham. And without throwing him under the bus, he did make a big mistake, um, which uh, made it 2-1, two leads. Um, obviously, goalkeeper's union and all that... But do you think if you managed to stay on and didn't get injured, we would have been promoted that day? I think maybe. You just you never know, do you? But um, what I would say is I was nervous and I'd already played maybe, I don't know, nine, ten games that season, however many it was. And it was it was a lot for a 19-year-old. Jack's a year below me, he's 18, and he hadn't played a game yet. Like, it's just not it's just not a realistic expectation to go into the biggest game of the season and expect an 18-year-old just to perform. I think if you are um, a club and you've got to choose three goalkeepers for your season, you've got one who's 36, injury-prone, one who's 19, hadn't really played before that season, and the third one's 18, then you're kind of susceptible to something potentially happening there at some point. It just happened at the worst possible moment. Um... So, I mean, it's very difficult to blame an 18-year-old. And anyone anyone who... Uh, if, you, if you speak to an 18-year-old, do you know what I mean? Just any 18-year-old, you'd be like... You'd understand pretty quickly why something could potentially go wrong in a, in, a, in a game of that magnitude. So anyone who's, like, still holding any kind of resentment towards Jack for that is just... I understand the emotion of it. I mean, come on, like, you need to understand the, the, the situation. And to be fair to Jack, he's gone on to have a brilliant career. He's been playing loads of games at Stoke um, in the Championship and getting interest. And um, 
and he's done it the hard way as well. He went to League Two, then League One, played in like full seasons, both both those leagues, got his move to the Championship. Um, so honestly, he's done brilliant, really well. Really happy for him. It was um, it was a mad day. I watched it back earlier. I didn't actually realise because the other game that was going on was Cardiff versus Hull. Cardiff yeah. won the league. Um, Hull needed to think better our result to go up. Um, Cardiff went one nil up. Then Hull went two one up. And then they had a penalty to make it three one. Their fans were on the pitch. They missed the penalty, so yeah. the Arsenal fans been on the pitch. And then Cardiff went down the other end and scored. And obviously, yeah. with your, with your injury, our game was like 15, 20 minutes behind theirs. <laughs> um, that was the point. Abdi scored a brilliant equaliser, but obviously, the, um, McCormack, who ironically set us up with a goal. For a couple Troy of got off. sent off as well, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. Two yellow cards. He, um, yeah, he went in for a mad tackle. Yeah. Uh, but that was just a mad game. But a little quiz question for you two and people in the comments. Firstly, who was the manager at Cardiff at that time? Malky Mackay. Yes, correct. Second one, who was the Leeds manager on that day? Who was the assistant manager? I know. I think I know both, but I'll let Sam have a guess and people try and do the comments. Was it, was it Neil Warnock? No. The Leeds manager. Go on, Jonathan. It was Brian McDermott. He was the manager. And the assistant was Nigel Gibbs, was it? Watford legend Nigel Gibbs, yeah. He popped yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. When, was, when, when was Neil Warnock there then? Because he was managing them when we beat them 6 1, wasn't he? Must have been earlier. Yeah. Was that that season when we won 6 1, or was that a couple of seasons after? No, I think you're right, Sam. I think you're right. Well, he must have been sacked or something halfway through that yeah, season. He must, yeah, he must have been sacked that season. So I just remember there's a video of all of his reactions when we scored those <laughs> six goals that season. It's hilarious. It's amazing, yeah. Um, obviously, I mean, we didn't go up automatically, which in hindsight led to one of the most incredible moments in football history. Um, mm. How did you feel going into the playoffs? Two legs against Leicester. Obviously, we played them away earlier in the season and Nathaniel Chalabar scored a ridiculous goal for us, um, if you remember that. Um, but how, what was the mood going into the playoffs? I think it was it was a big downer um, to be in the playoffs after the season that we'd had. Um, it's so difficult to kind of <clears throat> pull yourselves around. And there's like this weird sort of 10-day to two-week break before... Um, oh no, sorry, that was after the semi-final, before the final. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's not right. But um, yeah, it was just it ha- it happens to every team sort of every year where there's someone really chasing the top two, and then suddenly you're in this whole new competition with someone who's just snuck in a sick, <laughs> just buzzing to be there, <laughs> and suddenly all the pressure's on you. It's it's not nice, but. Um, what was the score in the first game? Was it 1-1? One, one, or... They won 1-0. Yeah. Yeah. We lost 1-0? Yeah. Oh, so Nate's goal then would have been during the season. Yeah. yeah. It was only a couple right. of weeks before. Right. Okay. I mean, we were better than them, like, throughout the season, weren't we? I think. Um, so, it was just frustrating that, I think, t- like, to lose the first game 1-0... And then be like, is this can't be it. Sure. I remember when they gave the penalty. I thought it was a penalty. I think I was the only one in that stadium at the time thinking, Marco. Like I was blaming Marco. Like he's dragged him back. Why has he dragged him down there? And then obviously what happened after that happened. But uh, since I've seen it back, it's never a penalty. I don't know why I thought that. It's not even close to being a pen. And Michael Oliver was the referee at the time. That's an awful decision. Like at that is an awful decision at such an important moment in the season. I can't believe he's given that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm actually thankful that he did in the end because it was brilliant. Yeah. He's now gone on to be probably one of the best refs, but he could have absolutely killed yeah. it. Yeah. That game was pretty incredible in terms of Vidra's first goal at volley. And he went through a goal drought, I think, before, and there was a lot of pressure on him. Deeney was unbelievable that day. Balls yeah. were just, just trapping balls, playing. Their, their relationship was brilliant. Um, we gave away a soft goal, Nugent, from a header, but then they combined again to make it 2-1. We've talked about the the uh, kind of the penalty. I actually blame 
Matthew Briggs. Let him oh, go. Yeah, yeah. Let him go past him so easily. Yeah. And, uh, was that, oh. a few minutes, but that that penalty, Harry Kane was actually on the pitch at the same time. Am I right in saying that you've played with Harry for under 21s? I did, yeah. Yeah. Were yeah. you grateful that he wasn't on the penalty? Well, looking back, yeah, very grateful. But I had no idea he was on the pitch during that. I had no idea that um that he was really in in the running to take it, to be honest. Um that is wow, that is interesting that he was on the pitch for that. I had no idea. Yeah, it's just amazing. I think they had um Jamie Vardy and Danny Drinkwater on the bench as well for them that day. Wow. Well. Yeah, football's yeah. crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it's nuts, yeah. Um before moving on to that Deeney goal, we'll talk about it more in depth. The forgotten goal that day, as I like to say, was Vidra's first goal. Oh, my God, honestly. Really ridiculous goal. It's like and if it wasn't bass and left foot volley. Like, it just gets completely forgotten. Yeah, if, if it wasn't for that um, Deeney goal, I think that would probably be like, what, a Puskas nominee, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, what was what was it like, your view of that? How good was Vidra as well when you, ever, you, when you were playing with him? Vidra was lightning. He was honestly a frightening footballer. Um, he could finish off both feet. His timing of his runs was brilliant. His link-up play with Troy was incredible at times. Such a good player. I think he struggled with injuries, just probably by way of how powerful and quick he was. He had a lot of hamstring injuries. But um, and, and he was also a big confidence player as well, actually. I think he used to get really down on himself and then he would go through a rough patch. But when he was on, he was honestly unplayable. Um, when we had him... Troy Deeney, Fernando, and Alman. I mean, it's, it's no wonder that we were we were up there that season. Yeah, he's probably the best finisher I've I've seen that I can remember playing for Watford. One on ones, especially unbelievable finisher. Yeah. So going on to that penalty, how are you feeling when it's given? Are you confident that Almunia's going to do the business? Um, I'm trying to remember back now how I felt. I, I think I felt it was probably over. I thought, oh, I, you know, that's that's it. He's just got to stick this away. And then uh, how long's left after this? Not long. Seventh minute. Yeah. Honestly, sickening. And then he saves it and we're all off the bench. So we were all off the bench anyway. Do you know what I mean? Ready to celebrate again without knowing it. But yeah, we were just buzzing when obviously Armonia, um saved, when Manu saved it. Um, and then, yeah, what happened after that was incredible, really. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure the whole experience is, is a blur. I think it's, it's for most Watford fans. It's almost like everything just happened in slow motion. I heard Troy Deeney speaking about it the other week, saying everything just happened in slow motion in front of him. Um, watching back the video footage, though, we can see you rugby tackling Gianfranco Zola, who you said earlier was your hero growing up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean... to do the conga with him. It honestly, it was embarrassing. I, can't, I don't know what I was doing. I was, it was just like I was sprinting down the line, and he just happened to be the person next to me. So I wanted to just celebrate, but I didn't actually know why we were all sprinting down the line. I didn't realize where Troy had gone celebrating. I was just running around, and like no one was celebrating with me. If that makes sense. Everyone just seemed to be darting towards where Troy had gone. Obviously, I know that now, and. Um, and I've made him slip over. I've nearly studded him in the top of the head. Just missed it. The top of his head with my stud. And then I've had to like sort of apologise and then just run off embarrassed, like <laughs> jump into the stand. Just get Awful. Away from the situation. Yeah. Um, obviously, as we said earlier, it's one of the probably the most watched clips in English football ever. Yeah. Um, looking back on your time at Watford and in English football, just how special does it feel that you were part of that? Yeah, it was honestly unforgettable. Um, it just felt like a lot of... I, it's so weird to think we didn't actually go up in the end that season because it just seemed like there was a lot of like old oh, stars aligning and things happening that were just, yeah, unforgettable. It was sort of just a, an energy about that season where even the last day of the season, the way that, that happened, it was, it, was like, it was like everything that could possibly have happened happened within the space of... <laughs> a season or like three games at the end of the season. It was honestly, um, sorry about that. It was honestly uh, crazy, really, really crazy um, season. And I, it's one that I honestly, one of my favourites, one that I'll never forget. Is it the, 
the the maddest or what was that atmosphere like and when that goal goes in compared to any other game you've ever played in your career is it number one yeah i'd say so yeah um that and then um actually going up there was one at brighton who scored it was it Vidra, it was. Vidra, it was Vidra, yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually then going up after those two years before, um, that honestly, yeah, that was an incredible feeling. And yeah. obviously, sorry, Dini obviously got the goal. What what was he like as a player? Obviously, it was a younger Troy Dini. Then he, ca he came on to become a Watford legend. Yeah. Win loads of goals in the Premier League, becoming our captain. We mentioned about his sending off in that Leeds game. But what was he like as, as as a teammate? And did you think he would go on to do what he did at Watford? Well, yeah, I remember obviously before he went um, away for a while, he just, I, I, I didn't have a clear memory of how well he'd done. I didn't have a clear like picture of the type of player he was. I think he was played out wide sometimes. Um, and then when he comes back into the fold, you kind of just assume that he's probably not going to be involved off, off the back of what happened. Um, I think we had big Chris as well up, up front and we obviously needed another type um, of player. And I remember just being blown away by the way he linked up with Vidra and um, Fernando in training. And I was just like, wow, I had no idea how skillful and intelligent he was either I had no idea or I'd just forgotten it or whatever it was. And I just remember those first few training sessions where he just seemed so sharp, really unselfish, like just in such a good headspace. Um, and then that just translated and, and went straight into, into the, into the game days really well. And everything you saw on game day, he, he, they were doing regularly in training and then he would score big goals and big moments. He, he, Honestly, yeah, without sounding disrespectful, he had so much more quality like than I than I realised before he came back, obviously, for that season. And then I mean from that point on, he was definitely the captain and the leader of the uh of the of the team, really. And it doesn't from that point on it didn't really surprise me um how his career at Watford sort of panned out in the end. Love that. And obviously we went on and lost the final against Crystal Palace. Does that result, and as you said, not going up, does it hinder your memory at all of the game? Does it not ruin it, but do you know what I mean? Does it... Of, of, the, of the final or of the... Does, yeah, the does the result in the final sort of put a bit of a negative spin on that Dini goal because we didn't go up that season? No, I don't think it changes the moment of the Dini goal. Um, I think that... It was a huge disappointment at the end of the season. To I mean, I, I don't think we prepared for the final the best way we could have. We went to Marbella. We picked up two or three injuries. They were sort of wheeled out there um, anyway. Vidra and Fernando. Um, neither of them were were fit. It was a hot, dry day. Did that didn't suit us? You know, they had a game plan and they had players to really. It was perfect for them. They just got to clog clog up the middle with Yedinak and counter with Zaha and was it Balassi or I can't yeah. remember who was on the wings and they had uh, Ian Holloway's a menace do you know what I mean like it's just he lives and he lives for those types of days when he's maybe the slight underdog so like everything really looking back um, yeah the, it, not the right was on the wall a little bit but you could definitely see how what happened ended up happening um so yeah, it was a big disappointment at the end of, at the end of the season. But we did go up a couple of seasons later. You mentioned it that glorious day in Brighton. Um, although there was further disappointment when we couldn't win the league after that last minute goal. That was a yeah. Goal. But yeah. talk us through talk us through that experience getting promoted. What was the plan in Watford? Were you going to area? What what, what did you do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we well, we won at Brighton, but we weren't actually up straight after the game. So we found out we were promoted on the way back. And it was just then straight out in Watford because we hadn't been promoted for a while, had we? It was 2006, maybe before that. Yeah. 
so it was honestly it was huge um for everyone and it just felt like the whole town had come out and we were in yeah bars along along the strip that famous Watford strip and then uh where did we go we actually went to Oceana I think we were still in Watford tracksuits just floating around every <laughs> you'd be like on the balcony looking down you just see like a red hoodie just sort of like there and then look over there and see like another Watford <laughs> tracksuit here and it's quite funny really but yeah, it was just sort of all players and fans all coming together and just being, everyone just buzzing together. It was just amazing. What a day. And then, like you said, we managed to sort of taint the whole thing by letting the last minute, the scrappiest goal you've ever seen in, in the 94th minute to stop us winning the league. But um, to be honest, I'd completely forgotten about that before you said it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as Watford fans, we can never have anything 100% perfect. It's just the way our football club is. There's yeah. an amazing picture, actually. Um of, of Jacob Coleshaw, who couldn't be on here today, he's 11 years old at the time or something like that, with, with you and Tommy Hoban by the pond outside Ocean. Oh, really? Yeah. It's a great picture. Um, moving back to the current day, though, um, obviously things have changed a lot in the last 10 years. I don't Do think we have to. <laughs> <laughs> we might as well mention it while we got him here. Um, I don't think there's any players here at the moment who are still there. Actually, Craig Cathcart's still there. I think he's probably the probably the only one um what have you made from things from afar this season with everything going on at Watford how the fans are feeling towards the board and the way the football club is run yeah I I um I obviously work with Slavin Bilic at West Brom and I just I'm such a big fan of his and I spoke so highly of him when uh, when he got appointed so I was really surprised to see um that didn't work out, and when 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 Slavin is is um, struggling to get kind of uh, a tune or, or some performances out of that team, then um, it's probably a lot more deep rooted than than what I realise. Um, obviously, you boys are a lot closer to it than I am, but it, I just I don't understand how what's happened, like how I don't understand how this situation has kind of transpired because. We're just talking about some amazing times where really the ownership were at the like they're the main reason why we even can recall these times and all these great players and like all the way through to way after I left when you boys made the uh, FA Cup final and like the semi final against Wolves, some of the, the wins that you've had in the Premier League against all the big teams. Um, several years in the Premier League so to, for it all to unravel so quickly is just um, I probably don't understand it as well as, as you guys but um, yeah it's just been a little bit surprising to see I did come and watch a game um, when you played Coventry at home I think yeah did they That's win or was it yeah, no? yeah that striker Victor Jokerez completely destroyed us yeah we lost 1-0 one nil, yeah. yeah tough one. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, it was yeah, it was really surprising just to see. Just I don't know. There seems to be like a lack of control, lack of patience. Everyone was they were just trying to score so quick. As soon as they got the ball, everyone was just trying to score. And um, yeah, completely different to the profile of team that I that I left obviously a long time ago. But different also to the profile of team that. I'd watched in the Premier League as well. So um, I don't know. There, there must have been a lot of change behind the scenes um, since I left. But uh, I, I just don't have a, a clear enough picture of why what's happened has happened. We'd done a video the other day and we were talking about uh, what managers we thought did best this season. I think we kind of agreed that Slav probably was the one who made us most solid and he might have been unlucky to lose his job. But Obviously, it was a while back now. And what but what experience do you have with the Pozzos? Did they ever kind of communicate with the players at all? Were they very much kind of not ivory tower, but separated from the football side of things? No, they weren't separated. They were definitely around. Um, the communication was minimal with the players, really. Um, I think that's just the way it is, especially in Italy. And... Players are 
disposable is a strong word, but like they're 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 I, it's probably how it should be. You shouldn't really have click um communication between owner and players. You know, the players should be speaking to the head coach and then and that's their port of call. Um so yeah, I mean everything that they did when when I was there was bang on, really. Like the quality of players they were bringing in that no one had ever heard of were just incredible. This and that the scouting network was just second to none. Um yeah, their their choice of managers always seemed to work or at least their decisions to change the managers always seem to work. And we kind of gained confidence in that. And it was sort of like, it was a mad way of doing things, but we, I, I at least anyway, enjoyed being different and to some of the other teams. And I remember going to England on the 21s or whatever and saying, we'll get promoted this year. You'll see, because I think we sacked Sonino when we were top of the league or something. And it was just, it was a different way of doing things, but I think we just had complete trust in their decisions and what they were doing. So um, I don't know whether that's been lost now more recently um, or what, but that's definitely the way I saw things when I was there. Before you know it, Jonathan, you'll probably be called back to be the Watford manager at some point, as I'm sure <laughs> everyone will be. Uh, but in terms of coming back in a playing capacity, a few people did ask, would you be open to coming back to Watford at some point in your career? Is it something that you've ever thought about? Yeah, I would. Um, it is something that I've thought about. It's kind of, I'm in a situation where, uh, it's a win-win where I'm I'm playing and I'm very happy um, here and I'm very settled in the city, in the club, uh, on and off the field, basically. But then at the same time, you know, I, I definitely think um, the highest standard of, of football is in England um, and it's so competitive. Everyone wants to play in England and it's very rewarding to do well as well in England so yeah. sorry have you got yeah. me yeah 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 all good sorry. um yeah so I mean it's my club really that's 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 where I formed my sort of my education in football as when I was in the academy <clears throat> from the age of 10 all the way through to becoming a, a professional it was all Watford. Um, there was no change. It went all the way through on the 11, 12, 13s. I never left and came back. So, um, yeah, it would be an interesting thing to do one day if it ever did happen. But it's not something I'm thinking on a day to day basis. It's just, um, yeah, every now and then crosses my mind and that's it. Give him a call, Gino. Come on. <laughs> Carl's close to your chest there. Um, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on today. I mean, it's it's mental that it's been 10 years since that Dini goal. Um, but it's been great to think back to those times and talk about them, particularly when things at Watford aren't so good at the moment. So, as always, it's been a pleasure and thank you for your time today. Thank you, boys. appreciate it. Good to speak thank to you both. Good stuff, oh, isn't it? And, and thank you again, Charlie. Um, make sure to like and subscribe. We've got some really good content coming in the summer. It's going to be a really busy summer to be a Watford fan, as always. So make sure to keep an eye out for our content. We'll be back for another video soon. Up the audits. <laughs>